Science versus Pseudoscience with Karl Popper. This video is part one of a new series I'm putting together on various topics within the philosophy of science. The first of these series will cover the problem of demarcation between science and pseudoscience. I do hope to do additional series like this in the future. I hope you enjoy it. How to determine what makes something true science as opposed to pseudoscience is not a problem foreign to our contemporary world. This problem of the demarcation or differentiation between science and non-science was precisely the issue Karl Popper sought to address in his essay, originally presented as a lecture, titled Science, Conjectures and Refutations. In this work, Popper was not seeking to determine a criteria by which to determine when a theory is true and not false. Instead, he was simply trying to determine a criteria by which we could separate the practice of science from other human practices. Right off the bat, he addresses a commonsensical conception of what makes scientific practice different from other practices, namely its inductive method. In this view, Science is different from other modes of obtaining knowledge because it begins with observation and or experiment. In other words, science is different from other practices as science begins with facts and or observations about the world from which one reasons out their theories. Another way to put it is that what separates scientific practice from other practices is that its theories are verifiable. While this view can seem a likely candidate for demarcation on the surface, a few moments of reflection can quickly illustrate the problems with such a view. Astrology, an example given by Popper, too holds observation and induction to be a key pillar in its method, but scarcely anyone would want to induct astrology into the realm of science. Other examples given by Popper include the Marxist theory of history, Freud's psychoanalysis, and Alfred Adler's individual psychology. Popper notes that, quote, the most characteristic element in this situation seemed to me the incessant stream of confirmations, of observations which, quote, verified the theories in question. A Marxist could not open a newspaper without finding on every page confirming evidence for his interpretation of history. He notes similar problems for Freudians and Aldarians. Seemingly any phenomena could be incorporated into their theories, even things which would seem to actively disprove their theories. He contrasts this with Einstein's physics, in particular his ideas on gravity, which suggests that the gravity of the sun, or any body of enough mass, would distort the fabric of space-time so that the light of stars behind the sun would appear beside it. Please don't at me, physicists and astronomers. I know this is grossly oversimplified. I'm just trying to illustrate a point. As Popper notes, making such a prediction in your theory is risky, and such risk is what makes a statement or system of statements true science for Popper. Making such a prediction is a make-or-break moment for a theory. If it turned out that gravity didn't bend light around the sun, Einstein's theory at least that limited aspect of it, would have been proven false. For Popper, this is how one can demarcate between science and pseudoscience, namely by the former's falsifiable nature. If there is no observation that could prove a theory wrong, it's not science. This sort of conception of demarcating between science and its imposters, while certainly having some value, perhaps as a necessary but insufficient condition for the making of science, has faced severe criticisms on numerous counts. Some critics suggest that Popper shifts back and forth between two notions of falsifiability. The first, a descriptive notion of science that places falsifiability as a logical property of statements. A theory is scientific if and only if it makes at least one prediction that could be false. Then, in the second sense, there's falsifiability as a prescriptive norm, a sort of ethical imperative for scientists, suggesting that scientists ought to try to falsify their theories. The problem here lies in the fact that where the second notion necessarily entails the first, 
if there's a scientist trying to falsify their theory, that requires there be a part of their theory that can be falsified, that entailment doesn't hold in the reverse. It's quite easy to imagine a theory, say, that COVID-19 vaccines contain a microchip. Please don't censor me, YouTube. I am making fun of these people. They are literally a plague on society. Again, to be explicit, this is in no way, shape, or form an endorsement of these demonstrably false theories, but an attempt at illustrating why they are so fundamentally incorrect and unscientific. Again, imagine the theory that the COVID vaccines contain a microchip. This, more often than not, is falsifiable in the first sense, but not in the second sense. The COVID vaccine contains a microchip is a falsifiable statement. There are observations that could render such a statement false. Where the pitiful proponents of such theories avoid falsifiability is in their behavior. They could be presented with plentiful evidence that their theory is incorrect, but they'd always find some way to avoid accepting that their theory had been falsified. This illustrates how a theory could be falsifiable in the former sense, but not the latter. As such, falsifiability could be an unreliable method for the demarcation between science and pseudoscience. Beyond these problems, Popper's conception of science seems to be fairly disconnected from what actual scientists are actually doing most of the time when they're actually doing science. Most scientists are not trying to disprove theories or falsify them, and most scientists, when they're confronted with genuine evidence that contradicts their theory, they don't abandon the theory, but they'll either find a problem in the data, they will modify their theory, etc., etc. Popper's theory seems to be a sort of paradigmatic armchair philosopher thinking in the abstract about what he thinks science is or ought to be, while not looking at what scientists actually do when they're doing science. This is by no means an exhaustive list of the criticisms of Popper's theory, um, but these are definitely some of the more common and popular ones you'll hear. I'll dive deeper into these criticisms of Popper in my next video on Thomas Kuhn with his responses to Popper. I'd like to say thanks for watching. This was a short video as a part of a new series I'm trying to put together on various topics within the philosophy of science. I think given our current cultural and political climate, this is a topic that is in dire need of being covered. Please come back for future videos in this series with further discussion regarding the difference between science and pseudoscience. If you can and would like to support the future production of these videos, as well as become a part of an exclusive reading group, support me on Patreon. I'd also like to thank my patron, Ryan Lindsay, for his support. Also, check me out on Facebook and Instagram for extra content. Links below. Again, thanks for watching.